Please join me in welcoming Phil, President Phil Hanlon. Thank you, John, and good morning, everyone. What an amazing turnout this morning. On behalf of everyone at Dartmouth, it's a pleasure to welcome you to this very special event, part of the 20th Annual Summer Lecture Series presented by Osher at Dartmouth. One of the great lessons that we seek to instill in all of our students at Dartmouth is a passion for lifelong learning. And nowhere is that passion more evident than through Osher. Each year, thousands of Upper Valley residents take part in exceptional educational programming offered through Osher, from courses to social events and excursions to outstanding lectures like the one this morning. So I'd like to begin by thanking our newly appointed president of Osher, John Sanders, who will be moderating today's discussion, as well as John Ferries and Pete Blyler, co-chairs of the Summer Lecture Series for luring such an incredible speaker to campus for today's session, former U.S. Secretary of Defense Bill Perry. John will have the honor of formally introducing Bill in just a few moments, but I simply want to say that we're delighted to have Bill with us today to speak about the dangers of nuclear proliferation, a topic that deeply impacts our national security and to which Bill has dedicated a great majority of his 65-year career. I also want to thank all of you for attending today and for your commitment to engaging in complex topics that affect our communities and our world. The liberal arts, a great Dartmouth tradition, at its best, instills in us an insatiable thirst for knowledge, a desire to be always broadly educated so that we can live our lives and contribute to society as educated, informed, and engaged citizens. So thank you once again for taking advantage of this special opportunity to hear from one of the world's most respected nuclear arms experts, not to mention a brilliant mathematician, which I really feel is dear to my heart. <laughs> Here to introduce him now is the president of Osher, John Sanders. Good morning, and thank you for being here. Before we start, uh, I want to make sure that everybody knows that there will be uh, an opportunity for uh, Bill Perry to sign his book, My Nuclear Journey at, at, My Journey at the Nuclear Brink, uh, in the back of the foyer. Uh, this book uh, has been gener generously underwritten by uh, one of our OSHA members. Uh, who has uh, allowed the price uh, to drop from $25 to $15, uh, and uh, we hope that many will take advantage of this. Thank you, President Hanlon, and welcome to you and your wife, Gail Gentis, to this 20th annual Osher Su at Dartmouth Summer Lecture Series. A warm welcome also to all of our members and guests and to the Osher uh, audience at the University of Vermont in Burlington. It is an honor to introduce former Secretary of Defense, Dr. William J. Perry. Bill left Carnegie Tech, which is now Carnegie Mellon, after a few semesters to enlist in the Air Cadets shortly after World War II ended. He went on to enlist in the Army Engineers and was posted to Tokyo where he witnessed firsthand the massive destruction caused by modern warfare. Tokyo had been destroyed by fire bombs, Hiroshima's destruction by a relatively small nuclear weapon was many times worse. On return from Japan, he completed his bachelor's and his master's degree at Stanford under the GI Bill. He then went to Penn State for his PhD in mathematics. He married Lee, his high school sweetheart, and lifelong confidant. They will celebrate their 70th anniversary this December. Thank you. 
In 1954, he became a senior scientist at the Electronic Defense Laboratories of Sylvania and worked on top secret reconnaissance projects. In 1962, he was called by Bud Whelan, head of the CIA's Office of Scientific Intelligence, and asked to come urgently to Washington. There, he helped assess photos showing without a doubt that nuclear-capable missiles were being installed in Cuba. The Russians had recently broken the nuclear test ban treaty by detonating a bomb more than 3,000 times the power of the Hiroshima device. In 1963, he left Sylvania to form his own ESL company, focusing on digital technologies and solid state components. He continued to have a close consulting relationship with government and military agencies throughout his career. In 1977, Secretary of Defense Harold Brown asked him to become Under Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. During this time, he proposed what he called offset strategies to multiply our strength and counter the massive Soviet arms buildup. These include things like advanced sensors, smart weapon systems, stealth technology leading to the development of the F-117, our first stealth fighter bomber, and GPS. He returned to Stanford in the Reagan years and helped found the Center for International Security and Arms Control. He developed personal ties with his counterparts in both Russia and China, and based upon the trust he had forged, he helped achieve bilateral dismantling of nuclear missiles in the United States and several former Soviet republics. In 1994, he was asked to become the Secretary of Defense under President Clinton. He was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom for his exceptional work. This is the highest civilian honor the country may bestow. He is one of a very few secretaries of defense with a deep knowledge of men and weapon systems combined with profound diplomatic skills. Bill and Lee have always led the support for improved quality of life and living quarters for enlisted men and their families. Bill has always been able to keep the big picture and the smallest details in sharp focus. He has spent his entire career pursuing the control of nuclear arms. Now, three generations of fa uh, his family work on the William J. Perry Project to foster an understanding of nuclear weapons and to reduce the possibility of their use. His granddaughter, Lisa Perry works as the digital media manager for the project and is with us today. Please welcome the Honorable Dr. William J. Perry. Well, thank you, John, for that one warm and wonderful introduction. And good morning to all of you. In the nightmare of the dark, all the dogs of Europe bark. And the living nations wait, each sequestered in its hate. Each sequestered in its hate. The poet W.H. Auden wrote those prophetic lines in 1939 on the eve of World War II. In the next six years, that nightmare led to the death of more than 50 million people. When World War II ended in 1945 with the dropping of nuclear bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the world wanted to believe that that nightmare was over. But within five years, the Cold War had started. And now the nuclear bombs that had ended World War II 
posed a new kind of nightmare. A nuclear exchange between the United States and the Soviet Union could have led in an hour to more deaths than World War II produced in six years. Indeed, a nuclear war threatened no less than the end of civilization. Leaders of our two nations at the time understood that and developed a strategy which they called Mutual Assured Deterrence, aptly nicknamed MAD, to try to prevent this catastrophe. MAD did work, but it was incredibly dangerous and more than once nearly led to a catastrophe. In particular, we came very close to a nuclear holocaust during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Have we forgotten the Cuban Missile Crisis? For some in this room, it may be easy to forget it because it happened after you were born, or pardon me, before you were born. But I will never forget it. I was there during that crisis as part of a small team that worked all day analyzing the intelligence collected that day. By midnight, we had prepared a report for President Kennedy on his desk first thing in the morning. So I knew exactly what was going on. Indeed, every morning when I went into our analysis center, I believed would be my last day on Earth. After the crisis, President Kennedy said that he believed that we had a one in three chance of going into a nuclear holocaust. One in three, not very good odds. I believe that Kennedy's assessment was optimistic. He did not know, which we now know, that the Soviet Union had already deployed tactical nuclear weapons which were fully operational and which the commanders had the authority to use. If Kennedy had accepted the recommendation, I'm indeed the unanimous recommendation of his Joint Chiefs of Staff and invaded Cuba, our troops would have been decimated on the beachhead by tactical nuclear weapons and without doubt a general nuclear war would have followed. The miscalculations of Soviet and American leaders at that time almost subjected our countries to a nuclear holocaust. And I believe that we avoided that holocaust as much by good luck as by good management. And the holocaust, had it occurred, would have just destroyed not only the United States and the Soviet Union, it would have wreaked terrible damage on countries all over the world, in China, India, Japan, Korea, countries that were spectators in the Cold War. In the nuclear war, there is no place to hide. Indeed, considering the long-lasting effects of radiation, as well as the atmospheric disruption of the sun's rays, it is doubtful that our civilization would have survived. Today, because of the ongoing hostility between the United States and Russia, we are recreating the conditions that could lead to a nuclear war, lead us to blunder into a nuclear war. Beyond the Cuban Missile Crisis, there were at least five false alarms during the Cold War that might have resulted in an accidental nuclear war. Because of our launch, launch on warning policy, an accidental war could result in a missile attack could result if our missile attack system experienced a false alarm. So how likely is that? During the Cold War, there were three such false alarms that I know about in the United States and at least two in the Soviet Union. That averages out to be about one every eight years. I personally experienced one of those false alarms and it changed forever my way of thinking about nuclear dangers. It occurred in October of 1979 when I was the Under Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. I was awoken by a phone call at three o'clock in the morning. And as I picked up the phone, still not quite awake, 
The voice on the other end identified herself as the general who was in charge that night of the American Air Defense Command. The general got right to the point. He told me that his computers were showing 200 missiles on the way from the Soviet Union to the United States. And for one horrifying moment, I thought we were about to experience the nuclear holocaust that we had avo narrowly avoided during the Cuban Missile Crisis. But the general quickly explained he had already concluded it was a false alarm. Why was he calling me? I was the research person in the Pentagon at the time. He was calling me because he wanted to figure out what the hell had gone wrong with his computers. He knew something was wrong, but he didn't know what. Well, there's a sequel to that story. I could not, that night, based on what he told me, determine what had gone wrong with his computers. It took us three days to get to the bottom of it. It was very simple. When the watch changed that night, the new computer operator coming in, instead of putting in the operating tape in the computer, mistakenly put in a training tape. And so what we got is a very, very realistic simulation of an attack underway. That happened in 1979, and I will never forget that night. So the question then arises is, could that happen again? And if it did, would we be smart enough to figure out what had happened? It was human, human error. That is, our system, with all of its safety features, was still vulnerable to a single person erring, potentially bringing about the end of civilization. Two things, two things saved the world from that fate. First, the watch officer that night was exceptionally thoughtful and responsible. Had he not been, we would not be sitting here today. And second, the context for the attack was benign. That is, there were no international incidents underway that made a Soviet attack plausible at that particular time. But what if that false alarm had occurred during the Cuban Missile Crisis? or during one of the Mideast crises we had where we had our systems on high alert. In that context, context is important, in that context, the watch officer surely would have felt obliged to pass the message on to the president. The president then said myself, would have been awoken at three o'clock in the morning. He would have had about, if he was lucky, 10 minutes to decide whether to launch our own ICBMs without context, hardly without a chance to consult with anybody. 10 minutes, and had he ordered the launch, there would have been no way of recalling the missiles or destroying them in flight. But the President would have started a global nuclear war by accident. Well, humans will err again. Machines will malfunction again. So we will have more false alarms. Even in the face of this, Today, both Russia and the United States still have a policy of launch on warning. And both Russia and the United States are building new ICBMs to replace the ones we built during the Cold War. That means ultimately, much will depend on the judgment of the watch officer in the United States or in the Russia, and the temperament of the Russian president or the American president. So today, just as in the Cold War, we face the possibility of an accidental war destroying our civilization. Let me say again, I believe we survived the Cold War as much by good luck as by good management, and today we are still depending on that good luck. When the Cold War ended, in 1989, the world breathed a huge sigh of relief. We had somehow dodged the bullet, a bullet that could have extinguished our civilization. And for a decade or two, that seemed to be true. But in the last decade, inexplicably to me, we are beginning a new Cold War. Let me sum up my whole talk then with my next sentence. I believe that today, the likelihood of a nuclear catastrophe is greater than it was during the Cold War, greater than it was during the Cold War. And yet we here in this room today are blissfully 
unaware of that. And therefore, our policies do not reflect that danger. In my talk, I'm going to explain why I believe that, why the dogs of Europe are barking again, and not just in Europe. I will visit those nations where the barking dogs conceivably could escalate into a nuclear nightmare. Russia, China, North Korea, Iran, and Pakistan, with special emphasis on Russia because they have the largest nuclear arsenal. Before I talk about Russia, let me qualify. I am, in fact, a Russophile. I visited Russia more than 30 times, I've led four Stanford study tours to, Washington, to Russia. I love Russian music, Russian literature, Russian art. I have many Russian friends, some for more than three decades. But I must tell you I am today very concerned about what is going on in Russia. U.S. and Russian relations today are comparable to what they were in the Cold War. How could we have let that happen? Have we forgotten already the existential dangers of the Cold War? During the 90s, after the Soviet Union dissolved, there was a very dangerous time in Russia for Russians. The possibility of a major disorder, even a civil war. I give great credit to the Russian people who got through that crisis without major bloodshed. But they did end in a period of economic collapse and gross abuses, for example, the privatizing of the state-owned property. The economic collapse entailed heartbreaking hardships for tens of millions of Russians, especially those on pensions. I and others argued, unsuccessfully of course, that we should assist Russia's transformation with something like a Marshall Plan. But of course that never occurred. But when I became Secretary of Defense in the 90s, I was in a position to foster positive relations with Russia, particularly with the Russian military. So I worked to bring Russia into the Western security circle instead of standing outside it, throwing rocks into it. We brought the Russian Minister of Defense into NATO meetings. I formed the Partnership for Peace of former Warsaw Pact nations working with NATO nations to participate in joint peacekeeping operations. We organized a joint military operation in Bosnia. And in that joint military operation, a Russian brigade, a crack Russian brigade, was assigned to an American division commander working in NATO. We actually had a Russian brigade as a part of a NATO operation. That took some high order diplomacy. And I have a few pictures to try to illustrate what happened at that time. So if you'll excuse me, I'll see if we can turn this on. This is a picture of the American Secretary of Defense, myself, shaking hands with the Russian Minister of Defense after we agreed that he would have his brigade work in NATO. And the card there, I don't know whether you can read it, they were holding it up, says Russia plus NATO equals success. You can hardly imagine that today. And this is a picture of the Russian brigade commander and myself. I went over about halfway through the Bosnia operation to pin a medal, an American medal, on the Russian brigade commander because he was one of the exemplary performance in Bosnia. That was one thing we did jointly with the Russians. We also jointly dismantled 4,000 nuclear weapons in the former Soviet Union. At the same time, by the way, I was also dismantling about 4,000 in the United States. We jointly agreed to honor Ukrainian borders. Here is a picture that had to do with the dismantling of nuclear weapons operation. This was at a place called Pergomysk, where, which is the largest and most modern of the Russian ICBM installations. At, at that site alone, there were more than 1,000 nuclear weapons targeted at the United States and we dismantled all of them. And this is a picture of the silo after we blew it up. And this last picture I want to show you, after we blew up the silo, this is the Russian Minister of Defense, the Ukrainian Minister of Defense, and the American Secretary of Defense 
in a three-way handshake, congratulating ourselves on this good job of dismantling the nuclear weapons. That period undoubtedly was a high point in U.S. and Russian relations. But when I left the Pentagon in 1997, I fully believed that we were well on our way to ending forever the Cold War enmity. But that was not to be. In the late 90s, we began a downward slide. NATO expanded to Russian borders, in my opinion, prematurely. Indeed, I strongly argued with the President against doing it. In the next decade, the United States installed ballistic missile defense systems in Eastern Europe, which the Russians considered a threat to their deterrence forces. Perhaps most importantly, this past decade, the United States has supported what was called color revolutions in the Mideast and in the Ukraine. And Putin, when he regained the presidency in 2012, believed that the United States was supporting a color revolution in Russia designed to overthrow his regime. And that's the reason, and he blamed Obama and he blamed Hillary Clinton on that, and that's the reason that the touch of enmity developed between the Obama administration and the Putin. When our new ambassador, Mike McFall, arrived in Moscow to present his credentials at about that time, the headlines in the Moscow Times said, American ambassador here to overthrow Russia. What a way to greet a new ambassador. So the bad relation today was stimulated in part by the actions of the United States and NATO. But it is also stimulated by aggressive actions taken by Putin to restore the glory and power of Russia as he saw it and to publicly thumb his nose at the United States. Whatever his motives, the resulting actions, and you should understand this very carefully, these resulting actions have been very popular in Russia and they're reflected in his very high approval ratings, approval ratings that any American president would kill to get. He annexed Crimea. He threatened eastern Ukraine, and thereby violating the so-called Budapest Agreement. He threatened neighbors in Europe with the Iskander missiles, which are based in Kaliningrad. And he indirectly threatened the United States when his head of media, Dmitry Kislov, publicly proclaimed, this was about a year and a half ago, Russia is the only country that can turn the United States into radioactive ash. That's the head of Russia media, no doubt speaking for President Putin. Of course, much of this bombast directed against the United States is rhetoric for domestic consumption. But it is not rhetoric that he had put rebuilding his Cold War nuclear arsenal as his highest security priority. And of course, we are following his lead. We have underway now, as we sit here and speak, a program to completely rebuild our nuclear arsenal, the latest estimate of which it will be at cost $1.25 trillion. And the taxpayers are hardly aware that this is happening. Have we forgotten the dangers of the Cold War nuclear arms race? Putin has also dropped Russia's long-standing no first use policy. All during the Cold War, for all of our concern with Russia, they were publicly proclaiming they would never use nuclear weapons first. And Putin has explicitly withdrawn from that pledge and said instead will be, nuclear weapons will be the weapon of choice if Russia feels threatened. So Vladimir Putin is playing a very aggressive game but he's playing with a very weak hand, aside from his nuclear weapons. He has serious demographic problems, including a declining population. He has a serious problem in Russia with drunkenness and in a precarious economic posture. Economically, they are basically a petrostate. Their economy prospered when oil was at $100 a barrel, 
and it founded when oil got down to 30, 40, or 50 dollars a barrel. A significant part of their government funds come from oil profits. Social programs are important to ordinary Russians depend on those programs. And so they're in a very serious economic problem today. To be sure, Putin blames their economic problems on American and NATO sanctions, which indeed are a small part of that, but the big part of his problem really has to do with the cost of oil. When oil was at $100 a barrel, he had an opportunity to use his excess profits to diversify his economy, but he did not do so. So there's a lot of trouble for Russia, but I want to emphasize that is not good news for the United States. Putin is diverting attention from this by playing his national card, which is annoying to the Americans, but it could be more than annoying. It could become real danger. I want to be clear on one point. I'm confident that Putin does not want a military conflict with the United States or with NATO. But he is playing a very dangerous game in the Ukraine and the Baltics. And the danger then is not that he wants a conflict or that we want a conflict, but that we will blunder into some sort of a conflict. Russia, NATO, for example, in response to his threat to the Baltic nations, has deployed a brigade there. What if the Russian brigade and Ameri uh, if the NATO brigade and Russian forces were really involved in some sort of a military conflict? Russia, of course, has geographic advantage, but the fundamental advantages are all with NATO. Conventional military strength, the economy, technology. The question then is not whether Putin will see an advantage to some sort of military conflict. I'm sure he will not. But that we will, again, we will blunder into a conflict. I think Putin understands that in any conflict, Russia would lose unless, unless they escalate to tactical nuclear weapons. In other words, unless they do exactly what they say they would do. If they did that, no one, not Putin, not the American president, not any of the generals, can really control escalation. And I do not like that scenario. That's my bad news about Russia. Now let's move on to China. <laughs> for three decades, for more than three decades, China has had an unprecedented economic growth, more than 10% a year, year after year, for 30 years. And that's, as I said, is unique and quite remarkable. But, but I think there's trouble ahead. For the last two years, their growth has dropped to less than 7%. Now, most nations in the world would love to have a 7% growth, but it's not enough for China. They have more than 100 million Chinese who have been left behind by this economic growth. And who every night see the good life in eastern China on their TV sets. That causes a real uh, political problem in China. Also, there's a question of whether their growth figure might have been fudged a little bit, so it's actually less than 7%. They also have minority problems in Western China. You don't read about them much, but there are lots of them going on. There are maybe 100 demonstrations each year against the authorities in China. And finally, and I'm sure you're all, all aware of this, they have a very bad pollution problem in China. Anybody that's visited Beijing or Shanghai, particularly in the winter, winter time, will understand just how serious the pollution problem. And that pollution problem is causing political problems. So the government needs a safety valve to deal with this unrest. And the time proven safety valve for beleaguered governments is promoting ultra-nationalism. In the case of China, that amounts to promoting anti-Japanese and anti-American sentiments in China. That is leading to some military aggressiveness, especially in the South China Sea. There's been a major growth in China in these past years in military expenditures, with special emphasis on what we call a blue water navy, making the navy more than coastal defense, having extend out into the oceans, and anti-ship missiles to deal with the American carrier forces off China. Their goal is to drive the United States Navy hundreds of miles from their coastline. Is the United States Navy willing to be driven hundreds of miles from the coastline? The answer is no. And so that's scenario number one 
for some sort of blundering into some sort of a military confrontation. Not a confrontation of the two presidents' order, but a confrontation that takes place because of commanders on the ground, or in this case, on the sea. They also are building artificial islands in the South China Sea. Generally, the problem is China regards the South China Sea as sort of an inland lake. And the United States and the rest of the world regard the South China Sea as international waters. So the Chinese actions are continually being challenged by the U.S. Navy, and that's scenario number two for a confrontation. Well, having given you these bad news things about China, let me sum up China by saying, on balance, I think we will work out these problems without conflict, simply because the stakes are so high and both governments realize the stakes are so high. But I must say, I still do not like the scenarios that I've spelled out to you. So with those two good news stories, I'll now switch to North Korea. <laughs> During the 90s, I worked in and out of government trying to bring about a non-nuclear North Korea. Uh, obviously, I failed. North Korea now has a nuclear arsenal, an outrageous rhetoric, threatening rhetoric to go along with it. I was in Pyongyang a number of years ago, and my first night there, I met with the North Korean president who showed me my schedule for the next day. And I looked at it and said, I don't agree with this schedule. There are no military men on this schedule. I was the Secretary of Defense. I want to meet some of your top military people while I'm here. So the next morning, I went to the first meeting, and instead of my scheduled meeting, the door opened and in walks a North Korean general. And the first thing he said to me was, this meeting was not my idea. I was directed to meet with you. It's a good way to start off a meeting. I was directed to meet with you. I don't think we should even be talking about giving up our nuclear weapons. So <clears throat> I said to him logically enough, why do you think nuclear weapons are so important to you? He said, to protect us from aggression. I said, from whom? He pointed, to you, from you. And this was years ago. It was when we, the time when the United States warship warplanes were attacking Belgrade, dropped bombs on Belgrade during the Kosovo crisis. That's the background for this next statement. He said, if you drop bombs on our cities, that will be followed by nuclear weapons dropped on your cities. Pause, not excluding Palo Alto, <laughs> my hometown. <laughs> oh, that got my attention. <laughs> of course, that was bluster then. But they now have an arsenal of medium range missiles capable of targeting all of South Korea and Japan and they're developing ICBMs which could threaten the United States. Presently, those missiles have conventional warheads, but they are, of course, developing and testing nuclear warheads. So the bluster of 10 years ago now must be taken somewhat seriously. So what to do? If you read the papers at all in the last month, couple months, you'll know that one of the things, options are being bandied about is what's called a preemptive strike. When I was the Secretary of Defense in 94, and we had our first, first crisis I faced, actually, was a North Korean crisis, we considered a preemptive strike. I had a plan on my desk for blowing up the nuclear facility at a place called Yongbyon. It would have had minimum consequence, very few casualties, but it undoubtedly would lead to an attack by North Korea against South Korea and cause thousands of casualties in South Korea. And the possible, that was relatively certain, what was possible is it could escalate into a nuclear war. Any war, North Korea would certainly lose. But a nuclear war, there would be literally millions of casualties. Half of the population of South Korea, more than 20 million people, live in Seoul and its outskirts, which are about a one-hour drive from the border. So South Korea would be devastated in any war. 
There's much talk in the United States about, oh, they are developing an ICBM that could strike the United States, but South Korea is our ally. We have to be thinking about what could happen there as well and not be so single-minded in our view. So I say a preemptive strike is a really bad idea. Diplomacy, well, it has failed in the past, and therefore people dismiss it. But I think it failed because we didn't address the basic question. What do the North Koreans want? Diplomats, when they conduct these negotiations, are sometimes famous for having a golden tongue. They can say beautiful things in a beautiful way. But a good diplomat, his tongue is less important than his ears, as he listens to what the other side is saying, what they want. What they want, without any doubt, is regime survivability. This is an abhorrent regime. It's a Stalinist regime, the last Stalinist regime in the world. So we abhor it, but they sort of like it, and they want to keep it. And so number one goal in North Korea is to keep the regime in power. Any proposal we make to them that, that does not give them an opportunity to see that happening, they will reject. If they can achieve that objective, then they'll go to the secondary objectives, which are economic improvements. All of our proposals in the past have helped their economy, but have not addressed their basic question. The last, my criticism of our diplomatic policy on North Korea is bipartisan. I think both Obama and Bush over that 16-year period badly failed in their diplomatic negotiations with North Korea. Basically, they believed that if they waited long enough, the regime would collapse. Unfortunately, that hasn't happened, not about to happen very soon. In the meantime, they're building nuclear weapons and long-range missiles, so we have to do something about it. The, in diplomacy, it takes carrots and sticks. The carrots we've had are economic primarily, but we've had no sticks, really. The only stick we have is threatening to go to war with them, which is not a credible threat. But China has significant sticks. They're the primary supplier of food and fuel to North Korea. And if they cut that off, there would be disastrous consequences. For reasons which are perfectly persuading to China, they've not been willing to do that in the past. A path to solution, then, a path to solution for China and the United States to agree on a joint diplomatic program where China pre presents the sticks and we present the carrots. And to get that, we have to somehow assure China that we're not there to, to overthrow this regime because the thing they do not want to happen if the government of North Korea to collapse and leave a failed state on their border. So there is a path forward on diplomacy, but it's a very difficult path, and it's not clear that we are in a mood to follow that path. With that, let me switch to Iran. It has, for many decades, had a robust nuclear program, nuclear in the sense that they are building, uh, they're producing enriched uranium. Enriched uranium can be used either for running power reactors or they can be used for making nuclear bombs. If you have the process that enriches them to a certain degree to make for power reactor, if you keep on enriching, you can get enough the kind of uranium, so-called highly enriched uranium, which is suitable for bombs. Uh, so it's a technology that can, that can go to two different directions. Um, we believed they were doing that to, to get to a nuclear bomb capability. Five years ago, I went and on my unofficial basis met with the Iranian National Security Advisor, who told me they did not want nuclear bombs. This was only for commercial use. We had a long discussion, and I must say I simply did not believe him because they did not consistent with the activities that we could see. But since then, two big changes have occurred. One of them is they have gotten a new president, Rouhani, by the way, who just recently won a re-election as president. And the second is not just the United States, but the world put serious sanctions on Iran. And the combination of having a president who wanted a moderate program, 
program, and those serious sanctions led to an agreement called the Iran Nuclear Agreement, which we got a little over a year ago. I think it's the result of this new government plus very effective sanctions. The agreement they got was significantly better than the one I thought they could get, based on my discussions, both with the National Security Advisor and their Foreign Minister. But as you may observe if you read the newspapers at all, you'll hear there's a lot of passionate opposition in this country to the Iran Agreement, including it was an issue in the last presidential debate. So there's major opposition to the Iran Agreement. I will point out this major opposition is strange bedfellows. Here are the three principal groups that are opposing the opposition. The 55% of the American Congress, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu, and the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. They're all opposed to it. The irony is that the opposition in Israel and the United States is because they fear that this agreement will allow Iran to get a nuclear bomb. Opposition in Iran, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, they fear it will prevent Iran from getting a nuclear bomb. Of course, both of them cannot be right. But I wanted to point out to one of you, any of you who are still thinking about this issue, the fantasy, what I, what I consider a fantasy, which is that the opposition to the agreement in the United States argues that we should withdraw from the deal, reinstate sanctions, and negotiate a better deal. Who can be against a better deal? Well, there is not even a remote possibility of maintaining sanctions if the United States withdraws. The sanctions were worldwide sanctions, not just US. US sanctions are not enough. They were worldwide sanctions. That's why they were effective. If we withdraw from the deal, our allies are gone in the sanctions. And, al and along with their sanctions, and without sanctions, Iran has no incentive to negotiate another deal. So we can withdraw and take the consequences of withdrawal. We will not, we will not, I repeat, get a better deal. And now I want to move to Pakistan. <clears throat> so far, I've given you a lot of bad news. My last case is Pakistan, and some of you may conclude I saved the worst for last. <clears throat> Pakistan has had three wars with India and lost all three of them. And so therefore, they've reverted to ir irregular warfare. <clears throat> Both India and Pakistan have nuclear weapons, somewhere between 100 and 200 nuclear weapons each. In addition, Pakistan has powerful terror groups that have some affiliation with some elements of the government. Some years ago, a terror group from Pakistan, with some government officials connected with it, undertook a major terrorist assault on Mumbai. I'm sure all of you saw the pictures of that on television. India showed restraint to the surprise of some people. I'm not about to show you a video, and the video is my imagination of what could happen if there's another Mumbai, if Pakistan mounts another large-scale terror attack on India. In this case, my th thesis is India does not show restraint the second time. So I'm going to now show you what I call my South Asian nuclear nightmare. This is a four-minute video which we designed to go on YouTube to educate people about what the issues are. It's simple-minded, cartoon sort of a video, but the facts behind it, I believe, are quite valid. In November of 2008, terrorists based out of Pakistan attacked the Taj Mahal Hotel and other targets in Mumbai, India, killing 168 and wounding hundreds more. I vividly remember as the scenes of horror played out on television for four days in front of a stunned worldwide audience. Despite allegations of Pakistani military involvement in the attacks, the situation did not escalate into a military conflict that time. But what if something like that happens again? 
I cannot help but imagine a darker outcome. My name is William Perry, and what follows is my South Asia nuclear nightmare. On the early morning of January 26th, members of a Pakistani militant group prepare for an attack on the Republic Day Parade celebration in New Delhi. The attack claims over 300 lives, injuring countless others. All of the militants died during the attack, except one. Upon interrogation, he reveals the location of the group's hideout. The information is quickly passed to senior government officials, and the cold start response is initiated. It gives the Indian military authorization to launch a punitive raid against the militants and cross over the border from the Punjab into Pakistani territory. In anticipation of India's invasion, the Pakistani government orders the Nassar Mobile Short Range Tactical Nuclear Weapon System to be deployed to the border. The UN convenes an emergency meeting and urges both sides to show restraint. Just before dawn, the Indian army quickly overwhelms the militant camp. However, most of the fighters have already fled deeper into Pakistan. As the Indians ponder their next course of action, the Nassar system is moved near the border, 10 miles north of Kasur. Knowing that Pakistani military doctrine authorizes the use of tactical nuclear weapons against any invading force, the move is perceived as an urgent threat by the Indian military. After tense consultations, the government authorizes an airstrike to disable the nuclear battery. Despite the use of conventional munitions in the airstrike, the intense bombardment causes one of the warheads to detonate. The nuclear explosion causes massive damage around the suburbs of Lahore, along with villages on both sides of the border. Military and civilian casualties are in the tens of thousands. Unable to identify the source of the nuclear explosions, Pakistan interprets them as a nuclear first strike from India. In response, the Pakistani military launches nuclear missiles at dozens of military and civilian targets in India. Minutes later, India orders a counterstrike. Twenty-seven major cities are completely destroyed. Casualties are in the tens of millions. Both governments collapse and the militaries take control. The radioactive fallout reaches as far as Australia. The radiation also saturates the Himalayas, contaminating fresh water for over a dozen countries, including China. The smoke and ash dispersed in the atmosphere lowers temperatures across all of Asia. Crop failures lead to food shortages around the globe, resulting in widespread starvation. Billions of lives are affected. nuclear war by accident or miscalculation. That is, we might blunder 
in a nuclear war. Those dangers went away at the cold, end of the Cold War, and they are now returning. A regional nuclear war, the danger did not exist during the Cold War. It is now very real. With India and Pakistan as a poster child of such a war, and North Korea following in the footsteps of Pakistan. And then, with another danger that did not exist during the Cold War, nuclear terrorism. It's now a very real danger, more dangerous than most people understand, an attempt to under foster an understanding of how catastrophic a nuclear terror attack would be. I created a scenario in the preface of the book I just released. I'm going to show, share this scenario with you, illustrated in stark cartoon fashion. We made another video, and this one based on a nuclear terror attack on Washington, D.C. Buried deep under these bone-dry high plains, in a covert section of a massively hardened centrifuge facility, a team is hard at work. They are members of a breakaway faction of the country's security forces, and they are busy enriching 40 kilograms of uranium. By July 3rd, they achieve their target of 90% enrichment and then transfer the uranium to a nearby secret lab, where another team of technicians assembles it into a crude nuclear bomb. On August 31, they finish their work. They put the bomb in a packing crate labeled agricultural equipment and transport it to a nearby airfield where it is stored in a warehouse. Two weeks later, it is removed and loaded onto an aircraft with civilian air cargo markings. It flies to Dubai, where the crate is transferred, along with other goods and equipment, to a global air transport freighter. Destination, Washington, D.C. The plane lands at Washington Dulles International Airport at 2.47 a.m. on September the 15th. By late afternoon, the crate is delivered to a warehouse in the southeast part of the district. Then, before daybreak, on September the 17th, the bomb is removed from the crate and loaded onto a delivery truck. Several hours later, an American citizen eases the truck out into traffic. She drives it to a location on Pennsylvania Avenue, midway between the White House and the Capitol building. At 11.09 a.m., she stops in the middle of traffic, climbs down onto the street, and triggers the detonator. The bomb explodes with a power of 15 kilotons. There are more than 80,000 instant deaths, including the president, the vice president, the speaker of the house, and the 320 members of Congress present when the bomb goes off. There are also more than 100,000 seriously wounded and virtually no place to treat them. Telecommunication facilities throughout the greater Washington area have gone down. Soon, cable news is broadcasting scenes of vast devastation from the Capitol. A short time later, all major news outlets report receiving an identical message. The message claims that five more bombs are hidden in five different cities across the country. It says one of these bombs will be set off each week for the next five weeks, unless all American troops based overseas are ordered to return immediately to the U.S. homeland. The nation is hurled into panic. Everything begins shutting down. Within a half hour, the stock market drops more than 70 percent before trading is halted. From coast to coast, Masses of people begin to stream out of cities, no matter their size or location. There is widespread gridlock. Cell phone systems are soon overwhelmed, and calls cannot go through. Internet access is impossible in many regions. 
and the nation is now in a constitutional crisis. By succession, the Senate President Pro Tem is now the country's president. But he is being treated for pancreatic cancer far from the Capitol at the Mayo Clinic. The Secretary of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, both of whom were testifying to the House Armed Services Committee on their recent budget request, are dead as well. Martial law is declared in Washington and surrounding regions, and the next day, the entire country. There is widespread looting and violence in many cities. Federal and National Guard troops are mustered. Soon there are reports of troops firing on crowds. There are increasing numbers of reports of crowds rioting against immigrants and foreigners. Within days, the military begins to construct large detention centers around the country. Much of my talk today, I'm afraid, has a doomsday ring to it. But that truly is not who I am. I'm basically an optimist. When I see a bad situation, I always look for a ray of hope. And my ray of hope is that I believe that we can still reverse the downward slide in the United States and Russian relations. And that is what I'm working for. If we could succeed in that, we could then work to stop and reverse the drift to an increasing dependence on nuclear weapons. But I realize that giving a lecture or writing a book is not going to get that message across to the millions of people it needs to get across to. I need to get the message across using the Internet. And so I've set up a W.J. Perry Project website, which you can go to, I've put on YouTube those two videos that you've seen, and I'm preparing two more. And I have prepared several MOOCs. MOOCs is an ugly acronym for a massive open online course. The first course, first course is already on the internet, and you can go and sign up for it tonight if you want to. It's free and no grades. You'll love it. <laughs> I have already said that these weapons have the power to end our civilization, and I do not believe that is hyperbola. In my own small way, I'm trying to address the problem of educating the public with my books, my lectures, a set of online courses, and a set of online videos. I'm also devoting some of my time to track two dialogue with Russian colleagues. Two months from now, I'll be meeting with the Luxembourg Forum, a Russian European-American dialogue focused on measures to lower the likelihood of nuclear war. Track two dialogues and educational programs may seem to you like a feeble response to problems that are so daunting. But the consequences of reliving the Cold War nuclear arms race are worse. The consequences of a nuclear war are so terrible that we must do everything we can, each of us, to prevent those outcomes. And so I've devoted the remainder of my career to this mission. I do this because I believe that time is not on our side, because having helped develop America's nuclear arsenal, I have special knowledge on how to dismantle it, and I feel some special responsibility to do so. And because I have eight grandchildren and two great-grandchildren, and I would like them to live in a world not face with the existential tragedy of a nuclear holocaust. So why do I keep working at this intractical problem instead of spending my golden years in the Garden of Eden known as Palo Alto? 
And I answer that question with one of my favorite lines from Robert Frost. The woods are lovely, dark, and deep, but I have promises to keep and mouths to go before I sleep and mouths to go before I sleep. Thank you. Please bring your questions on three by five cards uh, to John or myself. We'll be standing at the front. Um, and we'll also have questions from the University of Vermont. Thank you.
Good, mor good morning and welcome back uh, to the question and answer portion, which is always uh, uh, exciting. Uh, just to announce that I know many people who wanted to uh, buy a copy of uh, Dr. Perry's book and, and have him sign it, there will be time to do so afterwards uh, in the same location. So, uh, Bill, a question uh, from our local audience. How close were you to a nuclear deal with North Korea in the 90s? In uh, 1999, uh, President Clinton asked me to, I was back at Stanford, and I'd already left the Office of Secretary of Defense. He asked me to come back to government part-time for six months or so to be a special envoy to North Korea. And I agreed to do so. But I wanted it to be a trilateral agreement. I wanted Japan and South Korea to be a part of it. <clears throat> so the first thing I did was ask the then South Korean president and Japanese prime minister to appoint a comparable person. And the three of us actually met for a period of about four months. And we came up with a proposal of what to do. We got all three leaders of the country to agree to it. And then they asked me to go to Pyongyang to present it which I did. I spent about a week in Pyongyang. Uh, I thought we were very close at that time. I, m I remember when our team left Pyongyang, we debated w what we had done there, and we pretty much felt we had done it. Um, the North Koreans were positive about it, but were very slow to act. And then they were so slow that we reached the final meeting on it in October <clears throat> the 9th of 2000. And we had, when the uh, Kim Jong-il was then the president, sent his top military man to Washington to make a final agreement. <clears throat> and we made that agreement while he was there. And President Clinton was prepared to sign the agreement with Kim Jong-il. That was in November 2000. The funny thing happened in November, called an election. And then the Clinton administration left office and the Bush administration came in in January. And then we didn't get, a, we didn't get the sign-in done before then, but it was right up to the signing. President Clinton didn't feel he should commit the next president and wait the next president to do the signing. I talked at some length with the incoming Secretary of State, Colin Powell, who approved of the agreement, said he would he assured me he would get it signed in February or March. That's how close we were. What happened in, in March was that uh, Kim Jong, <clears throat> uh, a new president came into South Korea, no, the, pardon me, the president, a new president in the United States, and the president of South Korea came over to visit him, that was Kim Jong, uh, Kim Dae-sung, came to visit President Bush. The day before he met with President Bush, he met with Secretary of State, Colin Powell, who said the same thing to him. He said to me, we're going we're to sign this agreement. And the headlines in the Washington Post the next morning were something like, <clears throat> Bush ready to approve of a Clinton program. And when the South Korean president met with Bush, Bush said, no, we're not going to do it. I don't know exactly what happened. I think my belief in what people in the administration told me, was that Cheney, when he got news of this, went to Bush and, and got him to override it. So the Secretary of State was for it. It would have happened. I think if Bush would have signed it, but I think one man was opposed to it with, with Cheney, and he, he, was, uh, he turned the tide. We did not have any discussions with South Korea for two years after that. No discussions at all. Everything was cut off with North Korea, I mean. I think it was a tragic mistake, and in my book, I say it was a one of the worst, one of the poorest examples, one of the uns, uh, unsuccessful examples of diplomacy in our country's history. We had it right in our hands and we let it go. I cannot say <clears throat> that that would have been completely successful. The North Koreans have a history of evading on their agreements and so on. But we'd surely be a lot better off than we are today, no doubt about that. I don't, don't want to be sour grapes about it, but I think we were very close. Oh, we should have had it. On a, on a perhaps. Me, I'll say one other thing about that. This agreement not only dealt specifically 
with nuclear issues and missile issues, but it dealt with the bigger problem of how to bring North Korea into the family of nations again instead of being an outlier. And it dealt with things about we were going to establish an embassy in Pyongyang, we were going to sign an agreement to end the end of the Korean War. We're <clears throat> trying to take steps to normalize relations, not just to deal with the munitional problem, the nuclear problem. On a, on a coming through, I, I should be holding this microphone, shouldn't I? I apologize for that. I'll do it in the future. On a perhaps happier note, do you see a potential peaceful reunification of North and South Korea over, say, the next 20 years? I can only see ahead a few years on that. I say not in the next few years. I can't see it at all in the next maybe five years. 20 years, I don't know. A lot can happen in 20 years. If you look back to where we were 20 years ago, for example, and say, who would have predicted the situation we did? So, so much can change. But over the next five to 10 years, I'd say not a chance. Why is China so reluctant to aggressively confront North Korea? <clears throat> Let me say, first of all, I think that might be in the process of changing. But the reason, and I've talked with Chinese presidents about this several times, uh, the reason fundamentally is that they fear a collapse of the North Korean regime might lead to civil war and disorder, uh, serious problems along the, their border with millions of refugees fleeing, fleeing across it. All of that, plus, and I think there's probably an even more important reason, they fear a unified Korea with American troops right up to their border. And I think to get a real agreement with North Korea, we have to have China in the package. And that means that part of our negotiation has to not only satisfy the North Koreans, it has to satisfy the Chinese concerns all during the Bush administration and the Obama administration, the strategic patience policy was implicitly based on the belief that North Korea was going to collapse. Aside from the fact that, that was a bad judgment, that view on the part of the American politicians was antithetical to what China wanted. So we could not get any cooperation with them in diplomacy because we had different goals as to what we wanted to accomplish. We wanted to see the, the regime overthrown, they wanted to see it preserved. So if we're going to have any cooperation with China, which I think we need to get a real agreement, we have to come to terms with China on what the outcome of North Korea is. And we have to sort of tell them we're not going to take actions to try to, try to explicitly try to overthrow the regime. I want to say again, this is an odious regime. I'd love to see it overthrown. I'd love to see it fall. But I think both the Bush and the Obama policies were feckless in that they wished it was going to fall, but didn't have any pro plan or program to make it fall. And wishing is not a strategy, so. <laughs> if only. China was angry when the U.S. recently deployed its terminal high-altitude uh, defense system in South Korea. Uh, to what extent does this further destabilize the, uh, the China-North Korea United States situation. This is part of a much bigger problem, and I want to vent a little bit on the bigger problem. We have the same problem with Russia over the ballistic missile defense system we're deploying in Eastern Europe. They see it as threatening their deterrent systems. China sees the THAAD system as threatening its deterrent system. Not just the THAAD, but other uh, ballistic missile defense systems we deployed in Alaska, for example. Uh, so we pay a price, and I think a pretty heavy price, for the deployment of those systems. We pay a big diplomatic price for doing that in terms of worsening relations with, with uh, China and the, with Russia. And the question is, is the benefit we get worth the price we're paying? And my answer to that clearly is no. And that has to do with my uh, negative view about the value or effectiveness of ballistic missile defense systems. This is a technical, I'm going now from, from a political issue to a technical issue. Um, I've spent a lot of my years designing electronic systems. If I had a choice between designing an effective 
missile system and an effective anti-missile system. I pick the missile system any time. Very easy to build a highly effective offensive missile system. Very, very difficult to build a defensive system. They have all of the advantages with the offense. And we have never really built one, nor had the Soviet Union, which has poured billions of dollars, many billions of dollars into missile defense, ever built one. It's a fundamentally very difficult problem. Uh, without going into technical details on it, the issue basically is that it's not only easier and cheaper to build missiles than to build missile defense, but you can add to the missiles decoys. The way you defeat a missile defense system is you saturate it. You put more targets up that they can handle. Well, and it's relatively cheap, actually, to put a lot of missiles up compared to the missile defense system, but it's much, much cheaper just with decoys up. And so <clears throat> most offensive systems which we have, and certainly that the Russians have, besides sending warheads out, they have maybe 50, 100 decoys to go out. They can be very simple things like just balloons, metal-coated balloons that inflate after they're released. And it's very hard for the defense system to discriminate between the missiles and the decoys. The best way of de dealing with the discrimination problem is to build a defense system that's the terminal that, that operates at a single point, defends a city, say, not an area. Because the last... <clears throat> 5% or so of a missile ICBM trajectory has to go through the atmosphere. When it goes through the atmosphere, the, heat, the resistance of the air in the atmosphere causes the decoys to slow down, whereas the warhead goes at full speed. So there's a very clear way of discriminating between targets and decoys once they're in the atmosphere. But that means you have to build a ballistic missile defense system for every city in the country. It's very expensive. And there, there, there are also problems with that one. So in short, I'm, I apologize for the long answer. In short, it's much easier to defend against, I'm, I'm pardon, much easier to attack with a missile system than it is to defend against it. So we're spending billions of dollars a year on building these systems. It ha they have a hard enough, hard enough time working on test programs against I in ideal cases, but if somebody puts up a test system that has hundreds of decoys as well as a missile, they don't have a chance at working. So my short answer to your question is ballistic missile defense systems don't work as advertised, and they're not, they're not worth the price you pay, both the dollar price and the political price you pay for deploying them. Here's a question from the uh, audience at the University of Vermont in Burlington. How do we counter the seeming lack of diplomatic involvement necessary to deal with these nuclear issues. How do we counter the seeming lack of diplomatic involvement necessary to deal with these nuclear issues today? I think first of all, we have to take, we have to, we have to take the issues more seriously. Uh, they require the highest priority attention during the Cold War, they were getting that attention. I mean, President Kennedy, for example, was intimately involving himself uh, with arms control negotiations. Most of the presidents during the Cold War were doing that. President Nixon was involving himself with arms control negotiations. So it's become, since the Cold War ended, it's become a backwater issue because People tend to believe that the problem has gone away, and I hope if my talk did anything today, it convinced you the problem is not going away. If anything, it's worse now than it was during the Cold War. But it's not getting the attention. So my the fundamental thesis of what I'm doing is that we don't understand the problems. For far, the problems are more serious than during the Cold War. Secondly, we don't understand that. Our body politic doesn't understand, and therefore our political leaders don't take the actions they could take that would greatly lower the dangers. And in particular, we're, we're, we're doing nothing today uh, to get political agreements, arms control agreements, that would diminish the danger and uh, provide ways of controlling it. During the Cold War, at least we understood the dangers and we were trying to negotiate and did negotiate with the Russians to take actions to try to lower those dangers. 
Nothing of that sort today. The last treaty we had was a so-called New Star Treaty, which is uh, signed by President Obama and uh, Putin many years ago. That treaty is due to expire in a couple of years, and there's no great talk now about renewing it. There's certainly no talk about a follow-on treaty. Obama's vision at the time he did the New Star Treaty is it was the first step towards a series of treaties that were going to greatly reduce the number of weapons, greatly reduce the threat. But nothing has happened on that, primarily, I think, because the uh, Russians have backed away from the idea of, of uh, treaties. They believe that nuclear weapons are very important to their welfare because their conventional forces are relatively weak. So they don't have much interest in it. And beyond that, any treaty has to be ratified by a vote of two-thirds in the U.S. Senate. And the New START Treaty, which is, in my judgment, is completely non-controversial, had nothing in it that I could really object to, almost didn't pass the Senate. President Obama did not submit it during the regular term because he was advised it would, he would lose. And then threw it in in a lame duck session at the very end and managed to get squeaked through. I think at that point he lost his enthusiasm for diplomatic approaches because it was so painful and so costly to get. He had to, in fact, to get that treaty signed, he had to agree to a, a, a group of senators, mostly Republican senators, on certain measures he would take on rebuilding the Cold War nuclear arsenal, which I think he should not have done, but he did. And so the price he paid for that treaty, political price and, and, the, and the side agreements he had to make to get it approved, was probably higher than the value of the treaty. I, I think that was his judgment, and therefore he decided not to go forward on any more treaties. So it's a combination of an apathy and an indifference in the United States plus a resistance in Russia, which does not allow us to seem to go forward. There are no likelihood today that there will be any meaningful agreements between U.S. and Russia in this field any time in the foreseeable future. When people ask me, as some people in fact this audience have asked me, what can I do about this problem? If I'm seized with the problem, what can I do about it? I have to go back and say, well, well, what am I trying to do about it? I'm not really involved today in what you would call political activism. Well, I go down and brief senators occasionally and go on to, uh, talk shows occasionally. But that's the side issue. My answer to people is you have to get yourself educated first on the problems. Our public today is simply not educated. So I'm devoting almost all of my energies to education, not to activism. If we get an educated public, then we're in a position, I think, to, to do something really significant in the, in, in the act, act. Even then, getting the United States public act, uh, and educated and being active, you also have to take two to tag, or you have to get the Russians interested in doing it as well, as well as other countries, but in particular the Russians. And that's not happening because of the government we have in Russia now sees their nuclear weapons as their one claim to being a great power and not about to only reduce that. In retrospect, was it a mistake for the United States to initiate the use of nuclear weapons in Hiroshima and Nagasaki during World War II? You know, that's a question I've asked myself hundreds of times. I will say this, that had I been President Truman, had all the facts available to him that he had at the time, I would have made the same decision that he made. That does not answer the question of whether it was the right decision. Uh, the benefits of do dropping the bomb then were undoubtedly, undoubtedly it saved many lives, millions of lives probably, because the alternative which the U.S. government not only was considering but had enacted was an invasion of the mainland of Japan. There was no doubt that an invasion of the mainland of Japan would have cost millions of casualties among American and primarily among Japanese soldiers and civilians. The Japanese army was prepared to fight to the death. Uh, they were fully expecting the invasion and they had the plans laid out, as I said, to, you know, to fight. Remember Winston Churchill's famous uh, line, we'll fight them in the beaches, we'll fight them in the town, or we will never give up. That was the Japanese army view. So I have no doubt that had we not dropped a bomb and invaded Japan, which was the alternative we were considering, there would have been millions of deaths from that. So strictly on that calculus, it was a good decision. That calculus did not take into account the aftermath. 
you know, the next 10 years, 50 years, 100 years, and so on, of giving us a world for nuclear weapons. In many ways, we, would probably, we might have been better off if the nuclear weapon had never been invented. But answering your question, given that it was invented, given that we were faced with those two alternatives, I think President Truman chose the lesser of the evils. Nobody has looked carefully at a question which I think is a very important question, which is, was there a third alternative? You know, between dropping the bombs and invading, the choice I think is pretty clear, but was there a third alternative? I think probably there was, and we probably didn't give it sufficient consideration or considerate thought. You mentioned when you introduced me that I had been in Japan uh, right after the war. I was also, I spent most of my time actually in Okinawa. Okinawa was the scene of the last great battle in World War II. And visiting Okinawa, particularly at that time before the, the repairing it had been done, it was, it was stunning to see what had happened in Okinawa. The capital city, Naha, was leveled. I mean, you couldn't find a building intact in the city. There were 100,000 Japanese soldiers defending Okinawa at the beginning of the war, at the beginning of the battle. At the end of the battle, there were, I think, seven or 8,000 surrendered. More than 90% of the Japanese soldiers were killed in that battle, or a high percentage of that when he committed suicide, what they called Harry Carey. So when our military personnel and our leader, President Truman, was considering dropping the bomb that was the framework of it. They looked at the Battle of Okinawa and said, this is a small scale of what will happen when we go into Japan. It was truly stunning to see what had happened. 100,000, almost 100,000 Japanese soldiers killed, almost 100,000 civilians killed. And American casualties, which were much smaller, were still pretty grim, something like 20,000. Most of them, by the way, Navy personnel killed in the so-called kamikaze attacks on the ships. That's just been the kamikaze technique had been invented just several months prior to that. So in answering that question, you really had to go back to the framework. Where were we at the time? Just come out of the Battle of Okinawa. We were already assembling our troops for the invasion of the mainland. And I think dropping the bomb was a preferable alternative to invading the mainland of Japan. The third alternative would have been to delay the invasion and work seriously for some kind of a diplomatic solution and agreed a, uh, some sort of a, an agreed capitulation of Japan. And there's certainly some possibility that could have been done in spite of the army. We never could have gotten the Japanese army to agree to it. Even after the Emperor Hir Hirohito went on the radio and announced that he was accepting, he was surrendering, and, and asked the Japanese pe people to uh, comply with that. The leaders of the Japanese army tried to establish, a, tried to a coup to overthrow the, uh, the emperor. They actually stormed the, the, the uh, palace, a little known part of history. They were defeated, but they were fighting, they were very much committed to fighting to the death. So I'm sorry for the long-winded answer, but to answer the question, you really have to go back to what was going on at the time. What was the history of the time? What were the elements, what were the factors President Truman considered when he made that decision? My only criticism of his decision was I know for a fact that there was no serious consideration of the third alternatives. But between the two alternatives he considered, I think he made the only choice he could make. Recently, the House of Representatives passed a, uh, a, a bill to add increasing sanctions on Russia, Iran, and North Korea by an overwhelming majority. Uh, can you comment on uh, this use of sanctions, basically economic warfare uh, in the modern era? Um, sanctions through the years have been demonstrated to usually be very ineffective. If by the sanctions, you mean more than just getting some sense of satisfaction of having hurt the other side. By the sanctions, you mean hurting them enough that they do what you want them to do. Sanctions, presumably, are designed to change behavior on the part of the person to whom you're 
applying the sanction, and by that definition, sanctions have almost always been ineffective. The one notable exception to that has been the sanctions against Iran that were made that led to the uh, nuclear agreement with Iran. And the reason they broke the rule, the reason they were effective, is because we had the whole world complying with them. We had all of Europe. We had Russia. We had China. And so the sanctions really hurt. And they did bring Iran to the negotiating table, and we did get an agreement, which not everybody will agree with this, but I certainly agree, was uh, in our national security interest. In general, though, sanctions are something you do because you f it makes you feel good, not because they have the effect that you advertise them having. Global migration into Europe and elsewhere uh, is at a record level. Uh, and it is said to increase global security concerns, perhaps maybe aggravate nuclear weapon possession. Would you comment on these and whether we sh what, what the role of restricting migration might be? I certainly understand this to be a very serious problem. I have no idea how to deal effectively with that problem. I don't mind pontificating on things that I have some understanding in depth about, but I don't have enough <laughs> understanding about that one. So I don't know what to do better than what people are trying to do. It's a very difficult problem, and I'm not into it deeply enough to offer constructive advice about what to do about it. I'm sorry. Should Trump be supported rather than condemned about his attempts to befriend Putin? Should President Trump be supported rather than condemned on his attempts to befriend Putin? Well, that's a very good question to which I have a complicated and probably not satisfactory answer. Uh, I th believe we'll not make any real progress on reducing nuclear dangers until we start a serious dialogue with Russia. And that dialogue has to address issues of mutual importance to Russia and the United States. Nuclear. What are the issues of mutual importance? We, neither one of us want nu any more nuclear proliferation. We, ought to, we agree on that. We ought to find a way of coming together and, and enforcing that. And now, neither of us want nuclear terrorism. And nuclear, you saw the video of the bomb going off in Washington, D.C. That bomb could just as well have gone off in Moscow or St. Petersburg. So we both have interest in preventing a nuclear terrorism. Uh, we both have an interest, although we have a hard time coming to agreement on it, on reducing the number of nuclear weapons. We both have an interest in reducing the danger of nuclear weapons. I told you in my talk about the danger of an accidental nuclear war resulting from a false alarm. Nothing could be more obvious than both the United States and Russia would not like that to happen to the extent that we ought to be willing to share our warning system data with Russia, because they have a system not as good as ours. A false alarm in Russia, because of a faulty warning system, redound, rebounds to an attack on the United States. So the whole set of issues in the nuclear field where we have common interests, and we're not even talking about them, much less than reaching a way of proceeding forward in a common way on them because we have so many other areas we disagree with them on. Syria, Ukraine, Crimea, the long list of things, what the threats they're making to the Baltic nations and so on, where we do disagree. And we keep getting those two issues mixed up, the ones where we have an interest in, common interest in advancing policy and the interest where we just fundamentally disagree. I was trained as a mathematician and in mathematics, if you're working with a very difficult problem, a complex problem with different variables to it, there's a technique known as the separation of variables. 
you so pick out the variable that you can solve and solve it and let the other one go. It's called separation of variables. Put it in layman's term, it means just because you can't solve all problems doesn't mean you can solve, can't solve some problems. So there's some problems with Russia we could solve if we got serious and started to do it. And those problems are in the nuclear field where the stakes are enormously high. So getting back to your question about President Trump, um, the minimum requirement is to do that is you're talking with the Russians. So I applaud his view of talking with the Russians. I don't think it should be considered treasonous to this country to be talking to Russians. Uh, they ought to be transparent discussions, and they, to, and they ought to be dealing with issues of, of great interest to in the United States. So it's very important that we do this. To do it, obviously, we have to separate out those problems where we disagree from those problems where we have a mutual interest. All of those problems, like many of the problems I can think of, where we have a mutual interest in the nuclear field. And we just simply need to get busy to do that. Even if you have to talk, even though you don't like people, even though you disagree with them, you have to find a way of talking with them about problems where if you can solve them, it'll be in the huge, it'll be in the overwhelming interest of both countries to do so. And nuclear issues are lead the pack in that area. Going to a different area, stealth technology for airplanes and submarines was developed during your tenure. Has has China and uh, have China and Russia uh, reached parity with the United States in that technology? No, but they're working hard on this, and they're very capable engineers there. So they'll come up. They already have stealth programs, operational aircraft with stealth capabilities. Uh, in the meantime, we've moved to the next level in stealth. Uh, so the answer, the simple answer is no, the qualified answer is, but they're making progress. Another technical question, last evening. Oh, excuse me, let's say one other thing about that. When we first introduced stealth, is that we developed, when I became the Undersecretary of Defense Research and Engineering, it was 1977. Within a month, I had been briefed on this idea Within six months, we had a prototype aircraft flying, which demonstrated the idea. And within th three, three and a half years, we had an operational aircraft built. So we moved very, very fast on it because I thought it was the single most important technology we were working on at the time. At the time, I believed we, we tried to keep it in deep security. The F-117, for example, which was operational already in 1980 or so, 81, was kept hidden at a base so that people couldn't see it. Only be pulled out when he needed it in an emergency. In the Gulf War, in Desert Storm, we pulled it out and used it as an, as an operational system. It was amazingly effective. It flew all of the missions over Baghdad, which is the most heavily defended city in the world. It had thousands of uh, anti-missile systems around Baghdad. Uh, the F-1 sending through 1,000 sorties over Baghdad and had not a single airplane shot down. Mm. It's an incredible, incredible achievement. At the, so as it, we felt it was so important that we tried to protect it, even the existence of the program. By Desert Storm, we unveiled it so we're no longer protecting it anymore. And I thought that within five or 10 years, other country would have copied it, but they had not. It's only within the last five or 10 years that we see Russian and Chinese moving in that direction. So they're a good many years behind. They probably have today a capability comparable to what we had in Desert Storm. But in the meantime, we've moved on to the next generation. Also during your time as Under Secretary of Defense, the GPS system was developed Last evening, we talked a little bit about that story, and I wonder if you could relate that to us. Yeah, I feel, I feel personally responsible for the fact that you have a GPS system in your car. <laughs> 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 but I have to admit, I had no idea that was going to be the outcome when we started the program. We weren't thinking about commercial applications. 
we're thinking about the military application of which I could see as being enormously important. Uh, but when I was the Undersecretary of Defense Research and Engineering, second year that I was Undersecretary, I got the budget figures about ready to go to the President and discovered that the GPS program had been cut to zero. We had an R&D program set up by, been underway for a good many years actually, and had actually orbited four satellites. And it takes about four times that many to have a whole constellation to give you continuous coverage. But four satellites are enough to demonstrate the principle. So we had four satellites up at that time, and the decision of the Bureau of Budget was to uh, cancel the program at that point, not go forward towards the operational GPS system. And this alarmed me because I believed it was going to be a very important program. But I had to be sure I was right. So I went to the then Secretary of Defense, Harold Brown, urged him to, to delay any action on that, give me a week's time to try to dig into it. So in digging into it, I flew down to the Kirkland Air Force Base, which is where we had the GPS project office. And they set my visit to a time which corresponded when those four satellites were within reach of Kirkland Air Force Base because they wanted to make a demonstration. I got down there and the Air Force major who was running the program, a very capable, very brilliant PhD in physics guy, was, uh, had this demonstration set up for me. We walk, usually when you go to an Air Force colonel when you have a briefing, some, they bring the PowerPoint out and they give you hundreds of charts and so on to put you to sleep. He had no charts, no PowerPoint. He just said, shook my hand and said, come on out and took me to a helicopter. Asked me to get in the helicopter. He said, we're going to give you a demonstration. And the helicopter had the windows blocked off. And it was sitting in a circle, painted circle on the, on the, on the runway. And the pilot was sitting beside me, and I was in, there was just two of us in the helicopter, and the pilot took off. Couldn't see a thing, you know, the windows were all blocked. He had little needles in front of him, which gave him the reports from the GPS satellites flying overhead. And he said, we're going to give you a demonstration of how GPS works. So we flew around the Albuquerque area for half an hour. And then he came back and landed on that very circle, which he'd taken off. And he couldn't see a thing. I was peeking out the curtains. <laughs> a little nervous, but he couldn't see a thing. And he landed, came back and landed on that circle. Well, I was impressed. And I went back to Washington and said, told Harold Brown, said, you and I are going to throw our bodies in front of the train, the, the, the Bureau of Budget train, and stop that cancellation. We're going to go ahead with this program. I had to make some compromises. The final constellation was going to have, I think, 24 satellites. We cut it down to 16 or something, which is enough to give us coverage at everything except extreme northern latitudes. But we went ahead. And if it hadn't been for that trip down to Albuquerque and that wonderful helicopter ride I had, it would, it would have been killed at that point, dead. So yes, I feel very, I feel your GPS system, you owe to me. <laughs> <laughs> You can't imagine how hard it is to overturn a decision made by the Bureau of the Budget. We don't overturn that one. Finally, what can we as a group in this room do to promote nuclear safety? Uh, by safety, I think it means security. Security. Yeah, for technical people, safety means making sure that the weapons don't accidentally blow up while they're sitting in the silos or something. Uh, well, I've uh, asked that question many times, and I just always come back to the same point. We have to get the public educated, step number one. And once that's done, then we can start considering step number two, which is political activism. Ultimately, it's going to take political activism to change this. Some of you may feel impelled to do that right now, and I, won't, I would not say you nay, but that's not what I am working on. I'm working on education. I think we had to educate not just a couple hundred people in this room, not just a couple hundred people at Stanford, but millions of people. And that's why I've devoted my efforts, not just to lectures and books, 
but to getting the message out over the internet. And I'm experimenting with ways to really get the message across to the most people. I've, that's why I'm doing things like these cartoon videos, because people actually watch them. You get them on YouTube and, and, and people see them. I hope to get not just a thousands or hundreds of thousands of people, but many millions of people. And the online courses we have and the videos we have are for that purpose. If we get the public energized on the problem, aware of the problem, then there are many things we can do. Nothing can be done seriously until we start reducing the number of nuclear weapons. And in my mind, the vision of the reduction has to be eventually getting to zero. I don't see a path for doing that, but I see that has to be the eventual goal. Um, along with that, reducing the numbers, the many things you can do to reduce the likelihood they will be misused. I want to be as clear as I can. All the bad things I've said, all the dangerous things about nuclear weapons that I said today, the danger we don't face today is one country deciding to launch a surprise attack on another country. That was what we worried about all the way through in the Cold War. A surprise attack by the a surprise disarming attack by the United, Soviet Union on the United States. All of our policies were oriented around defeating that danger. All of the systems we built, the reason we end up with tens of thousands of nuclear weapons, all stems on that was the, that was the goal we were trying to achieve, but to defend against a surprise attack from the Soviet Union. In retrospect, that never was the danger. The danger was we would blunder into a nuclear war. I gave you the example of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Neither Khrushchev or Kennedy wanted a nuclear war. They were doing everything they could to prevent it. But in spite of what they were doing, we almost blundered into one. Um, so <clears throat> it has to be in our mind somehow that the real danger is blundering in a nuclear war, and what can we do to reduce the likelihood of blundering in the meantime? The single most important thing we could do today is to keep ourselves from accidentally launching a nuclear war. I gave you the example of how we've had false alarms in our warning systems. I talked about the three that I would know about. There were also two in the Soviet Union one of the things you might want to do as an educational program is go to the movie, <clears throat> The Man Who Saved the World. It's a documentary movie about the Russian watch officer in 1982 when his computer was showing an American attack. All of his subordinates were urging him to pass that up to the president. And he was a background in computers. He said, something crazy about this computer. This doesn't sound right. And he didn't pass it up to the president. Who knows what Brezhnev would have done if he'd gotten this message at 3 o'clock in the morning that there's an American attack underway in 1982, which is kind of a dicey year, if you, if those of you who were there would remember. But he didn't do that. And I think he is right to call himself the man who saved the world. He had, he passed it up to Brezhnev, the may well have been triggered in the nuclear war. By the way, his reward for saving the world is he got reprimanded for his serious from his superiors for not obeying orders. His instructions were to pass that up, and he didn't do it. <clears throat> so it's the danger of blundering in the nuclear war is the real danger we face. And the most obvious way that can happen <clears throat> today is with a false alarm. And yet we still have a system called launch on warning. We st we're busy not only maintaining the ICBMs we have, but building a whole new generation of ICBMs. I've written an op-ed in the New York Post saying we should let our ICBMs phase out and not rebuild the next generation. But I have very little likelihood that that op-ed will ever, will ever be carried out. Not only is this president going to go ahead with the ICBM, but our last president, President Obama, who understood the issues I'm talking about, was prepared to go ahead with a new generation of ICBMs. So it's very disheartening at times. But we have to keep up the faith and keep working on the problems. So the big danger today, I think, is that we will blunder into a nuclear war. And so we can direct our immediate policy improvements into finding ways to reduce the likelihood of a blunder. And the single most important thing we can do is get away from this problem of a false alarm in our warning system.
Dr. Perry, my sincere thanks.